Hello and welcome to On Purpose, the audio subscription service for the chiropractic profession. I'm Dr. Patrick Gentempo, and sitting across from me, as always, is Dr. Christopher Kent. And we are actually at uh, CLA and creating, well, a CWA world headquarters. We have a franchise training going on. We've got, uh, I think, 12 or 13 offices being trained for uh, creating wellness uh, at our, our headquarters today. That's a four-day training they're going through. But in the meantime, we have a guest that's come to visit us here at our new offices, just got the tour, and uh, came to sit down with us to make this particular recording. And I'm, I'm incredibly excited and proud of, of what this person has accomplished in chiropractic. And let me tell you, it was no small feat. Uh, you've heard him on the tapes before, or CDs at this point. And uh, he's from uh, Dothan, Alabama. That's Dr. Kirk Erickson. So, Kirk, thanks for uh, coming up. Chris, Pat, thanks for having me. So uh, we're here really, Kirk, to talk about something that you accomplished. You've gotten, you've published a textbook that's uh, published by uh, Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins, because those two merge into one major uh, publisher now. You know, it's a, uh, probably one of the biggest, uh, you know, quote unquote, medical publishers in the industry at this point. I believe point. the technical term is monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a, a textbook that they've published. The title of the textbook is Upper Cervical Subluxation Complex. And, uh, and you know, we've gone through the textbook. Chris, I see he's got about 67 tabs in there of things to look at. I can't imagine the effort that this was, over 500 pages of text, beautifully done. And, you know, uh, you know it's multiple colors multi and, and beautiful graphics and drawings and renderings and so on. So, Kirk, let, let me just start out. What gave you the idea to do this? Well, I guess it would start off with um, <clears throat> me beginning chiropractic school and being so intrigued by all the different chiropractic techniques that were out there. And so I decided very early on that I wanted to go out into the field and visit as many different chiropractors as I could do using different procedures and techniques and just observe the differences and see what I wanted to do with my future. And one of my first quarter instructors was Dr. John Grostick. And, of course, he was probably the most popular teacher at life. He was voted Teacher of the Year the previous two years, and everybody you know, loved and admired the man, and myself the same, until I found out that he only adjusted the atlas for everything. Right. And I was so disillusioned, I was so turned off, <laughs> I just could not understand. I thought it was ridiculous. So I totally put off upper cervical, and I continued my search, watching different procedures. And of course, you find in practice that the doctors, whatever technique they're doing, the ones that are using the most specific type adjustments, whatever the procedure may be, seem to get the best results. And I did like that. But the next quarter, I had a teacher named Dr. Larry Steinley. I don't know if you remember him, Pat. I vaguely remember him. He was also a very popular teacher, and he invited me to his office. And this is what really transitioned me. One of the first patients that I saw um, was a 12-year-old boy that he was taking care of. And the parents told me the story that up till a couple of years prior, the boy was having 12 grand mal seizures per day. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he had been to all these different medical specialists and uh, very little benefit to the care they were giving him. They even took him to a full spine chiropractor who actually helped reduce the seizures by a couple less per day. But when they were referred to Dr. Steinley, and keep in mind they were coming from South Georgia up to Atlanta to see him, that Dr. Steinle gave him an upper cervical orthospinology type adjustment and the parents said he went from 12 grand mal seizures per day to one mild seizure per week. Wow. And the thing that struck me is that this was one adjustment. This didn't mm -hmm. take three weeks, four weeks, three months, and so on and so forth. And the child, of course, was going to school now and was developing more like a normal child. Well, I continued my search and I saw many others quote unquote miracles in his office, but I would hang out with Dr. Stephen Sheik in his office and see amazing things. One day I was there and he adjusted a patient for the first time and she got off the table and said, so that's what was wrong with my hearing. And then she walked out into the waiting room and said to her companion, she says, the doctor back there pulled on my ear and got my hearing back because <laughs> she was completely deaf in her one ear. Wow. Inc incidentally enough, when I started clinic practice um, at Life, uh, one of my first patients was completely deaf in his uh, right ear. He also had a, a really unusual uh, type of an eczema on his fingers where his fingers would split open and bleed right. and he had all these medical mm -hmm. treatments and so forth. But he came to me just with some little mild neck pain. That's all he had. And we gave him one adjustment. He held it for three weeks. The second adjustment held for five weeks. And after the second adjustment, he came back and says, 
look at my fingers. So they've completely healed. And I've had this problem for five years with no help. He says, you think the adjustment has anything to do with it? And I said, well, we know that your body is going to function and heal better if you're free of subluxation. So who knows? He says, but that's not the most amazing thing. He says, I got a problem now. He says, my wife stays up late at night and watches TV, and I got to go to bed early. So what I do is I roll over on my left side and I go to sleep because I can't hear. He says, now I can't sleep at night because I hear out of my right ear. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the thing that's interesting, he was 60 years old. The but, Harvey Lillard syndrome. Yes. yes. But he was 60 years old, but every winter he was having to put tubes placed in his ears. Oh, boy. And uh, that was the first winter that he didn't have to do that. So this um, continued with um, you know, basically shaping my view of things to come. And, you know, when I was at Life, um, I was a very passionate student. I, uh, I was, I'll tell you how crazy I was. I joined a practice management company in second quarter. <laughs> I wanted to be in practice so bad. And so, you know... What, what year did you graduate, Life? 1991. Okay. And so I was really... This was very important to me because I did not want... I was very impressed by the fact that this type of practice was really focused on the correction of the spine as opposed to a therapeutic approach of the more treatment the better. Right. And keep in mind, um, I did not want to have a practice where I had to see a patient every day for three weeks, three times a week for three months and, what, and so on. But I do want to make it clear though, I'm not disparaging that. Right. Because if you're doing subluxation based care, if you're adjusting your patients precisely, that's just your way of doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It just didn't fit my personality, what I wanted to do. Right. And that's what attracted me to, to this work. I was also so attracted to the fact that the doctors had such a respect for the adjustment and for the subluxation. You have characters like Dr. Ken Umber and Dr. Larry Steinle that were just funny guys and silly and didn't take themselves seriously. Right. But when it came to that adjustment, it was life or death. Yes. And. Um, and, and, and I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't gloss over that. I mean, I think that's very critical that uh, there's almost a reverence. You know, when, when I, I talk to people a lot of times about not becoming mechanistic and they're adjusting to, in, in the sense that they just, they're just pounding meat all day in their office. Yes. Just, you know, everybody comes in, three adjustments up the spine or more or what have you. Whereas when, uh, you know, because I get, uh, amongst other things, upper cervical uh, Blair work. And um, that, you know, there's just one adjustment they're getting. There's so much focus, so much precision, so much seriousness about it that the intensity of that one adjustment is incredible as compared to people who are just saying, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just you know, move multiple segments on multiple people multiple times a week. Yes. And again, not to, it's not disparaging one versus sure. the other, but just that kind of, uh, that kind of serious uh, reverence uh, towards the one thing you're going to do at that moment in time uh, is, is, I think, very powerful. Well, I heard one chiropractor, uh, and I believe he was an upper cervical doctor, say he sees it as neurosurgery from the outside that deserves the same degree of focus and precision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know what? Doctors that do this work really look at the adjustment as an invasive procedure. Mm -hmm. Now, that shocks people when they first hear that. Now, we have a profession that's incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. But when we say invasive, if we truly believe in the subluxation complex, mm -hmm. if we buy into this that we project to our patients, you have to realize that the adjustment impacts the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. And it is wonderful to develop a philosophy that says that no matter what you do, only good can come of this. Mm -hmm. And that's very convenient for ourselves, but yet there's a responsibility, and Dr. Grostick really preached this hard, that you know this is not something that you need to just go at, and, and it is a very... Um, poking and prodding type way. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be serious about this. And uh, this was something that I really found um, in, a, in a personal case. I had a roommate in college who was seeing an upper cervical doctor and he was a new student at Life and he had severe asthma. Mm -hmm. And he had been under upper cervical care for quite some time but he stated that he would seem to get sicker under care as opposed to getting better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would help, sometimes it'd get worse. And one time uh, we were uh, in the room, this chiropractor had come to visit him and gave him an adjustment in the room. Um, and that night, he got so bad, he quit breathing. I had to take him to the hospital, wow. stayed up all night, and I thought he was going to die. He almost died. Well, the next day, I said, look, enough's enough. I'm taking you Dr. Bobby Smith. Um, he's one of the best in, in the city. And when Dr. Smith x-rayed him, we found that he was being adjusted on the wrong side. Oh, boy. And when he did the correct adjustment, he said within seconds his lungs completely opened up. 
without even trying. It was just his body doing this. And I think that when we, we uh, educate patients about the subluxation, which is very important, you know, the thing that's really important to get across to them, if you're doing the same adjustment over and over and over again, and every time they come in, they're always the same, the implicit message to the patient is I'm always subluxated. I always have nerve interference. And so your message gets diluted because it doesn't become real. If, but luckily for us, most people don't really stop and think about it. They just kind of go with the program and they go with the flow. But um, it is something that uh, chiropractic upper cervical has been labeled as um, being very mechanistic. And I, will, I would define it as this. The analysis, the assessment, and the correction of the subluxation is mechanistic to a point because even though we do feel like we are making a correction, we recognize that the body is making also part of the correction. Right. But we are incredibly vitalistic in our philosophy of health and healing because we truly practice that we are not healing the patient mm -hmm. because we correct them and we allow the innate intelligence to function at its optimum. Right. And, and that's something that really resonates with me. Yeah, I think that's a great, great distinction. Well, also the specificity and the use of objective outcome assessments is something that I've always respected upper cervical people for. Uh, you know, back to my old Palmer days when there was a very strong upper cervical bias, um, we were taught to use radiographic analysis. We were taught to use skin temperature instrumentation. This was before, of course, surface EMG and the subluxation station yes. had been developed for chiropractic applications. But the issue was take that adjustment seriously and dedicate yourself to perfecting that art because yes. that's what you're about. That's and, absolutely. you know, I, I contrast this sharply with the issue of a symptom-oriented approach where one of the terms that, that really gets me nervous that's uh, kind of slithered its way into the lexicon is dosage. Mm -hmm. And the, nosage, the notion that manipulative therapy, uh, you know, the dosage should be, should be given. Well, how do you... <laughs> How do you determine the dosage of setting a fracture? How do you determine the dosage for suturing a laceration? You know, you're, you're trying to fix something. And I, I think the same thing is true of subluxation, that you're, you're attempting to make a correction and, and to manage that patient through that process. And, and there is a specific outcome that you're looking for, and there are physiologic measurements uh, that you utilize. And, and the other side of, of the old Palmer days, again, not to reminisce, but uh, something very important that I thought was, was lost was they said, don't let yourself become perverted in your thinking by getting emotionally involved in symptoms. Yes. Uh, of course you have to be empathic and compassionate and reasonable in recognizing emergencies. No one's saying that's not the case. But uh, instead of chasing symptoms up and down the spine, focus on correcting the subluxation. And again, this this was regardless of whether there was uh, an upper cervical or full spine emphasis, but clearly yes. the, the focus was on upper cervical work. I heard an interesting analogy by Dr. Cecil Laney one time. He said that um, in terms of differences between different chiropractors, that in some cases you may have a leaky faucet that leaks so much that it overflows the sink and spills over into the floor. Some doctors will go and actually correct the leak and allow the floor to dry on its own. Whereas some, car some doctors may let the leak continue and just wipe the floor three times a week forever. <laughs> and it's just a, a contrast. And, yes. uh, you know, and I, I do really want to touch on the different outcome assessments here in just mm -hmm. a bit because it is very important. It's a very important sure. part well, of upper cervical well chiropractic when we, when we care. Um, but, you know, I'd like to really maybe just real briefly touch on really what sold me on this work. And when I heard mm -hmm. this story of how the Grostic procedure actually began, and this goes back to the time of the Great Depression. And a man named John Francis Grostick is working as a, men, as a manager in a men's clothing store. It was John D. Grostick's father. Absolutely, right. yes. And John Grostick became very ill. Um, very ill, was actually diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. And back in those days, medically, there was not much that could be done. So he got so ill to the point where they gave him a prognosis of one to two years to live. Well, out of desperation, Grostick went and sought out the care of a chiropractor that worked in the same building of his, of his clothing store. And the chiropractor adjusted him a few times and said, look, I've done as much as I can for you. The best I can advise to you is to go to BJ, Dr. B.J. Palmer in Davenport, Iowa, which Grostick did. 
And this is right at the time when HIO first came out. Mm -hmm. And so he would, this was a very revolutionary concept. And B.J. Palmer took care of Grostick and rapidly his symptoms diminished and he became healthy mm -hmm. and went into remission, so to speak. Grostick went into ch to chiropractic school, graduated healthy, went out into the field and had an accident with his counterbalance breaking on his tube stand and the tube came down and violently hit him in the side of the head and neck oh, wow. and severely subluxated him. I didn't know and that. Shortly thereafter, he developed symptoms of Hodgkin's disease. His lymph nodes swelled up, he, except for it was interesting. This time he got worse. Mm -hmm. He was much worse than the first time. He was um, actually bedridden and actually given at 1.2 weeks to live. But the thing to keep in mind, and here's the point, he was seeing chiropractors during this whole period of time that did HIO, but they could not correct the subluxation or get him to hold the adjustment. Mm -hmm. So he had to eventually go back out to see B.J. Palmer in, in Davenport and eventually recovered after getting under B.J.'s care. And so here is the perplexing dilemma that Grostick has. On one hand, his life is dependent upon chiropractic care, but on the other hand, these other chiropractors can't do what B.J.'s doing. And I think we all know that B.J. was a master at what he did, but B.J.'s system was a qualitative analysis as opposed to a quantitative analysis. In other words, you've got a listing of ASRA, ASLP. The difference is that B.J. Palmer knew how to come up with a tailor-made adjustment. He discusses this in detail. That's why it disturbs me when I see a lot of doctors talking about B.J.'s philosophy of innate, just get specific, get your intention, and let innate place the bone, because he did not practice that way. That's the philosophy, it's a very important philosophy. But you talk to the doctors that practice with BJ, you read his writings, he talked about a listing of ASX, RXX, PXXX, where he would position himself incrementally more in each direction. Mm -hmm. But his way of teaching, he would show an x-ray to students and say, well, the reason why I'm doing this or that is because of the x-ray. Can you not see it? It's very obvious. Mm -hmm. So Grostick set out on his path to research and develop a system where it could be duplicated from one doctor to the next. And it's not so much a system that dictates exactly where the vertebrae should be lined up, but it is a system that enables the doctor to understand, to know where he starts and where he uh, finishes from the adjustment to determine where he's going. Is right. it correct? Is the subluxation correcting? Is it getting worse? Um, what to do next? And this was very important to Grostick. So uh, then he ended up developing a whole system that started uh, known as Grostick Technique, and I believe today it's referred to as orthospinology. Yes, th it's the history um, after Grostick uh, passed away in uh, 64, I believe, and I'll tell you an interesting story of how he died. A lot of people don't know this. Um, Grostick was developing instrumentation for so assessing patients. He outlived patients. BJ then. Yes, interesting. yeah, he actually outlived BJ, and he was actually kind of a forerunner to you guys because with the, the wonderful technology you have with the Inside Millennium, he was developing some type of instrument to assess patients subluxation-wise. Well, the story goes that the FDA, or whatever it was called in those days, got wind of it, mm -hmm. and they stormed his office, and they took all his stuff oh, from his office, and this so disturbed him that um, he died the next day of a basically of a massive heart attack well, or I an aneurysm no that ruptured. It was stress induced basically. I had no idea. And the idea was that Dr. Grostick said that his father had scar tissue in the heart they felt from the Hodgkin's disease and so there was a weakness there and, and what else. So that was that was unfortunate. But um, you know it, it really with this type of work what you find is that it matters how you deliver the care. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, this seems to be very implicitly true and, and seems obvious, but I think a lot of um, doctors challenge that notion that um, all you have to do is basically get close. And the thing with this work is that it makes a difference how precise you correct the subluxation. I did a research study in 98 where we looked at 458 patients and we assessed the, how well the subluxation corrected and how well the patients did symptomatically as well as objectively as well and there was a significant improvement. But Pat, if you remember when we first talked in 95 about this, I made the comment that it's not the adjustment that helps the patient, but it's the holding of the adjustment right. that helps yes. the patient. Right. It is the restoration of neurological integrity that improves the optimal functioning of the, the human being. Right. You know, I'm, a, I'm just 
amazed and overwhelmed at the headquarters here and what you're doing with your creating wellness concept. And of course, what I'm discussing here is just one part of this whole picture here. Um, and you're kind of taking care of all the other issues. But this is, you know, a very important part of it, obviously. And I think it's something that um, I, I really hope chiropractors and really, I hope it resonates with someone, what I'm trying to get across. Dr. J.K. Umber, who I also dedicated my book to, to him as well as Dr. Grostick, he used to say to me all the time, he said, son, an adjustment is an adjustment only when it is an adjustment. <laughs> yes. And just because you deliver a force into a spine does not mean that you corrected a subluxation. Yeah. yeah, the old adage about hitting with a shovel is not true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And granted, I can give you many case studies where I did not give an adjustment. I thought I did, but uh, you know, basically the outcome assessments we used told us that we did not. And to the, the best adjustment has three components. One, you must make a biomechanical correction, whether that's structural or increasing range of motion, whatnot. And then you must reduce neurological interference. Right. But the third one is that you must restore biomechanical integrity, mm -hmm. stability. Because if you don't do that, you're just providing a stimulus, mm -hmm. just a reflex. Right. But if you restore stability, the adjustment will hold, and that gives the patient the most optimum ability for health and healing, which is really what we're trying to do because our philosophy states that we don't heal people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, innate intelligence does. So we have to be able to let innate intelligence have the best chance of doing that. So, the, uh, incidentally, just uh, as a pickup, because um, you were in such a great historical uh, you know, review, uh, John Grostick Jr., um, is, uh, you know, picked up the Grostick work and brought it forward, and he died, I think, in, in the mid-90s. I, I remember, I can't remember exactly yes. this year. So out of curiosity, which, which uh, Grostick were you, were you uh, acknowledging in your book? John D. Grostick, because he was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you knew Dr. Grostick, yeah. I think. And Chris, Chris knew him very well. Very well. Yeah, they were very good friends. And, uh, you know, I would love to say that I was Dr. Grostick's um, buddy, mm -hmm. but um, I was probably more of a pest to him than anything else <laughs> because I was a junkie. Everywhere he went, I was there <laughs> listening. I would go, I would, every two, three quarters, I would make an appointment to go in his office with all my questions and all my criticisms because you have to realize I was very critical of this work mm -hmm. initially. And because I'm a very analytical person, I don't like BS. Mm. And I want to know that something, I'm being told something that's true. And uh, I just, just being around the man, obviously he was so humble, yeah. incredibly brilliant. He, he was, was someone, man. he was someone that could speak on so many different levels. He could have a conversation about advanced anatomy and physiology and then turn it into a discussion on quantum physics. And the next thing you know, he's talking about the development of the, the atom bomb and then have a theological discourse. Yeah, that's what I used to enjoy. <laughs> yes. And yet he had a way of talking to you as if he's not any more intelligent than you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't talk above you. And uh, I just, I respect him so much. And people say, why do you do all these things? And sometimes I wonder why. My wife asks me why too sometimes. <laughs> but I think what drives me is a, a sense of just that I owe something back to the profession one and to these doctors that played such a role in my life that gave me so much, that took time, that did little things for me that maybe I didn't realize it at the time and did things for me that I didn't even know about. Right. Um, and I feel an honor. And I don't want people to forget these, these pioneers. And there's many pioneers in chiropractic. You know, talking about John Francis Grostick, his father, well, many people may not realize that he was the man in the profession in those days. It was B.J. Palmer and John Grostick. Now, eventually, years later, it became Clarence Gonstead was the man in the profession. But um, Grostick had probably one of the most amazing practices in the whole profession. He, he was interesting in that he averaged seeing close to 100 patients per day, but he only accepted four or five new patients per week. And he had a waiting list of several months because basically no one ever left. Now, mind you, you know, the, the caveat here, though, is that he wasn't seeing people three times a week. Absolutely. So if he was seeing 100 a day, you know, and it was, you know, the next day it was a different 100 people, and the next yes. day it was a different 100 people. Yes. So, uh, that, yeah, it's very important sure. to understand. Well, we were discussing a, another chiropractor, and um, a friend said, well, you know, she's very busy. 
but she has thousands of patients because she sees them rather exactly. infrequently. Yeah. And they sure. come from afar. She'll tell you come back in four weeks. You know. Do you, you're familiar with Arden Zimmerman, the upper cervical doctor, who no. first developed the first instrument. Um, he had a similar story as Grostick. Um, he was out in California. There was a you reviewed his oh, case. He's got that treatment. strange contraption. The, yes. Right. If when he died, he had fifty-eight thousand case files. Yeah. Wow. Fifty-eight thousand when uh -huh. he died. Wow. Yeah. So it's amazing. But you know, Pat, um, in the early nineties. You know, I think subluxation-based care became a buzzword within the profession because insurance reimbursement was going downhill and, and people really grasped onto this, which was a wonderful thing. But I think a lot of doctors latched onto it as a philosophy. They thought that, okay, I'm subluxation-based. All I got to do is add philosophy to what I'm doing, and I got it. But chiropractic is a science, philosophy, and an art, and one needs to blend. And, and one thing I, I, I like to say is that a philosophy without a science is primarily a bunch of interesting words spoken by a charismatic speaker. But a science without a philosophy lacks the appropriate guidance and direction to ask the appropriate questions right. for research studies. Right. However, a science and a philosophy without an art lacks practical application and thus is of limited value. Mm -hmm. So there is a blending there and yes. you two have been my heroes because you're one of the, the, the small percentage that I've noticed that have that balance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important that we realize that, um, you know, we got to practice what we're preaching here. And uh, I think one thing that going on what you're discussing is that it gets disturbing sometimes that volume is what is important. Volume is what so much is focused on. And volume is important. You need to see a lot of people. You need to get your numbers up. But that's not what's important. Right. It is the correction of the subluxation that's important. Right. And by doing that, you can see more people. Because you, you don't have to see the same people over again. Right. And uh, maybe that requires spending an extra minute or so with a patient. You know, I have uh, this past week, I have a patient, I've had a number of patients that are paralyzed that I've seen come in wheelchairs. And, and this man is paralyzed from the, from the neck down. And I've been seeing him now for three years, once a month, like clockwork. And of course, we have to get him out of the wheelchair and put him on the table. I actually do a leg check on him, if you can believe that. And yeah. it actually correlates incredibly well. Mm -hmm. And we've done wonders for him. We've had another wheelchair case where we actually got him out of a wheelchair. One adjustment, he was able to move his foot. By the time we wheeled him from the, um, from the adjustment room to the post x-ray room, by the time I walked back there, his wife was with him. She said, look, he's moving his foot. And we eventually got him to be able to take four steps, 40 steps on a walker. But, you know, sometimes I think we focus so much on the volume and it, it can affect the care. I'll give you an example. I have patients that come, one patient that has seizures, multiple seizures, one after another after another, when she's subluxated. When I get her on the table and as I work the subluxation down, the seizures will shut off as soon as I set the atlas. Not until then. It won't shut off initially. Mm -hmm. But once it's set, then they cut off. Now, if I'm behind and I'm rushing, I could just say, okay, let me just do one adjustment, one hit, I got it. But I think it's so important to have an assessment pre and post, whatever technique you're doing. Because I would be the first to say that upper cervical care is not for every chiropractor. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only thing out there. There's wonderful things in chiropractic. But whatever you're doing, I would implore you to have a, a system of assessing patients before and after. Mm -hmm. And the insight technology is one thing that um, orthospinology has endorsed since probably the mid-90s. Yeah, for a while. Um, as, a, as a technology because uh, for many, many reasons that we can get into. You know, one, one of the things that we're very uh, obviously happy and, and flattered about is the fact that you, in your book, in your textbook, you've published many cases showing the, uh, the pre and post scans on the, on the Insight Surface EMG and, and Thermal Scanner. Uh, so it, it's just great that now, for you know, the people who challenge and say, oh, you know, this is kind of experimental technology improvement, you know, we've got now a, a world-class textbook put out by, a, by the preeminent uh, publisher of the world in these types of textbooks, uh, and, and these, this technology is published within it, in the context of chiropractic, in the context of subluxation, exactly how it's supposed to be used. Well, that's, that's the wonderful thing about this book in general, and the fact that it does a wonderful job of reviewing surface EMG is, is really just the tip of the iceberg. That same theme permeates the entire book, and I must say there, there are very few things in chiropractic that impress me, but this, this most certainly did. And I, I was uh, very honored to be selected as one of the reviewers, and all I can say is after all those Xerox sheets and, and 
emails back and forth and, and hand scrawled notes and such to see what it really looks like yeah. when it's done is, 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 is beautiful. A, a wonderful thing. But it, you know, it begins with the anatomy and biomechanics and um, again has meticulous references and, and great illustrations but probably the part at least in the beginning that moved me the most um, dealt with uh, the neurology which um, again looked at the neuroanatomy which I don't think has been adequately covered in any other text certainly not in one place putting it together uh, showing the various neurological connections uh, you know this is this is the safety pin cycle taken to perhaps its most elegant level and um, uh, it talks about the various physical mechanisms involved you know those of you who have been listening to us uh, have heard all kinds of things on purpose about the various receptors that exist um, in the discs in the ligaments surrounding the spine in, in the meninges and all of this stuff has finally been put in one place in context with great illustrations and um, you know whenever anyone questions uh, the veracity or, or the scientific basis for a lot of these statements uh, here it is all in one spot. I think I lost some years off my life putting redoing the introduction to the yeah. neurology section and I want to acknowledge Dr. Dan Murphy for um, uh, certain parts of really developing my way of thinking mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, um, mechanoreceptive type models. Yes. Um, Dr. Grostick, I would give the credit for the cord tension models. Yes. Um, but uh, it really, um, you know, it is complex, but it's not so complex that you can't understand it. Absolutely, and that's and, the beauty of this. Yes. It, it puts it all together in one spot. Well, I think the thing to keep in mind, and what's, so, what's the big deal about the upper cervical spine? Why, I, I had a chiropractor when I was a student telling me, he said, well, the atlas is no different than T11 or, or T10 or whatnot. And, of course, yeah, that fine. is... We'll sever the cord at the level of your choice and see what happens. And actually, <laughs> and actually you know, you bring that up, there is research in there in the medical literature that talks about that. Yes. About sever, at having a paralysis at lower thoracic mm -hmm. levels as opposed to cervical and how it affects the immune system, mm -hmm. which the immune yes. system and how it's compromised by neurological dysfunction mm -hmm. is covered heavily in there. Yes, but exactly. But there is many reasons why this is, this is so important. Um, the upper cervical spine is very unique, obviously, anatomically, kinematically, and neurologically. Um, and there's a host of reasons which we don't want to waste too much time on, but a couple of things I, I just want to mention. We talk a lot about how the atlas is the most freely movable segment in the spine. Well, that's true in relationship to atlantoaxial rotation, but it's not much movement there that occurs in lateral flexion and rotation between mm -hmm. the occiput and C1. Mm -hmm. This is a critical issue because when we take our x-rays and we find a dis significant displacement between the atlas and the occiput in lateral flexion and rotation, this is something that's very abnormal mm -hmm. and this is something that the body has a tough time coping with because in normal motion there's what they call coupled motion. Mm -hmm. When you bend your head sideways you have a little lateral flexion, you have a little rotation, a little translation. These things tend to decrease tension on the central nervous system. When someone is subluxated, they have an uncoupled force that hits the spine that misaligns it in an uncoupled fashion that the body can't cope with. Mm -hmm. And of course, the things that we pick up on the insight technology, being the imbalance of muscle tone, is one of the body's ways of adapting and dealing with this mm -hmm. to the best of its ability. The problem is the suboccipital muscles in the upper cervical spine are not designed to actually move those articulations. This is something a lot of people don't realize. There's research that discusses because of the heavy content, the authors say that there's a bewildering amount of muscle spindles in the suboccipital muscles, but very little tendon organs. Mm -hmm. So they're designed more for monitoring exactly. the actually what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. And I think the muscles that, and, and with the insight technology, we're really not picking up those muscles anyway, they're too deep. Right. But we're picking up the superficial muscles which really react yes. to the subluxation. And I want to make a comment about the insight. I told you how I joined a practice management firm in second quarter. Well, my uh, uh, consultant was John Whitney, Dr. John sure, Whitney of sure. Whitney Transition, and I really admire him a lot. But one thing he, he said to me that, that really stuck with me, we all know wonderful chiropractors that are excellent adjusters. Right. They give you the best adjustment they can, but they don't do so good in practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then we know the opposite true mm -hmm. as well. Right. So one thing Dr. Whitney used to say is that, 
great results must not only be delivered, they must be perceived. Mm -hmm. In other words, when as a chiropractor, we adjust the patient to get their hearing back, we do whatever to them. Sure. We think it's a wonderful thing and we expect something back from them. We think they owe us something. But the reality of it is, they paid us good money to correct their spine and to get whatever result there is. They might have even expected it. Right. And we get kind of our feelings hurt because they're not referring as a boatload of patients. But the thing that you have to do is not just give the goods, but you got to display it. Yep. And what you got to do is make the subluxation tangible, mm -hmm. something you can see, feel, yes. smell, and taste. And what I love about the technology is that you can vividly display how they are when they're subluxated and how they are when they're healthy. Right. And this connects with people. And of course, obviously, the graphics and the color and whatnot um, really adds to it as well. Absolutely. But it's a very big piece to the pie, as well as the information that the doctor gets. Because I don't use your technology just as a patient education tool. I use it to tell me how well am I doing? Right. Mm -hmm. Where do I need to go? Well, I got to tell you that, and that's such a common misnomer. Most people think that the tool was developed for patient education, and they don't recognize that was a, a byproduct. In other words, Absolutely. We, uh, you know, it was developed, especially in, in my practice with uh, Christopher and I working on it. It was uh, saying, you know, how I felt like I was selling a product I wasn't sure I was delivering, and uh, I said, you know, you know, I felt like I was in conflict and contradiction because I'm doing all this ortho neuro testing. But telling a patient I'm here to correct subluxations, and none of these tests, you know, a positive Kemp's test doesn't tell me if they're subluxated or not. Absolutely. And I said, so what is the what is the end game? What are we really trying to affect? It's the nervous system. So I said, what am I doing in my evaluation that shows me the nervous system? And I said, virtually nothing, you know, in reality, in in the context of subluxation. So uh, that's where we started developing it, and it was only after that that when I could see it, well, then I could show it to patients, and that's why it became a tremendous patient education and recruitment tool. But the primary intent from Dr. Kent and I in developing the technology was clinical assessment. That yes, was what yes. its primary intent was. You know, I've been using the technology since I think January of 93. And of yeah. course, I think I started off with the 4,000 where we had the yeah. ground on the wrist, yep. and then mm -hmm. I went to the 5,000, and then of course 7,000, now the millennium. And uh, you know, in the back where I have some of the pre and post scans, if you notice, the very first ones are from the 5,000. And right. the reason why I used those is there was a study we were doing at that time. It was actually a blinded double-blinded study we did where we did an, an adjustment and a sham adjustment and we tested them pre and post EMG, um, leg check, yeah, thermocoupling and whatnot and what you see is pretty interesting is even though we contacted the atlas and only adjusted the atlas we um, saw a dramatic change within five minutes full spine. There was, there was a part of the pilot study that we did that was so amazing to me. We didn't know this until we watched a video later we actually had the dynamic electrodes hooked to the lumbar spine mm -hmm. and we would set up in contact and adjust and when we looked at the video later what we found was that even though with the with the grostic adjustment there's you, there's not much movement that occurs you don't mm -hmm. move the patient right. it's very light force but every time i would deliver a thrust into the spine you would see a reading on the i guess you say the oscilloscope mm -hmm. of across the screen with the dynamic electrodes and they would just plummet. Mm -hmm. They would bottom out yep. every time I, I contacted the atlas, even right. though we were looking at the, right. the paraspinal musculature in the lumbar spine. And it was so interesting. But, um, you know, I tell you, it takes uh, one thing I had a chiropractor talk about, you know, uh, the weirdness of upper cervical, because, you know, it is a little weird, you know, at times. We recognize that. But sure. one of my friends told me one time, he says, you know, it takes a lot of balls to tickle someone behind the ear and tell them that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it is... Uh, it Bar is, ovaries if you're a female. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. We've got to be politically correct. <laughs> so, uh, Kirk, let me just talk to you about this, this labor, because I can't imagine the amount of work that it takes to create a textbook like Well, just to give them a feel, how many references roughly are in there? There's over 1,200. Over 1,200 1, references. Now, the difference also, there are some textbooks that are out there that are great textbooks, but it's like 15 authors. You know, there's exactly. multiple authors contributing sure. with an editor. You wrote this on your own. I mean, obviously, you went out and got some help from people, but you are literally, you're the only name that's the author of this textbook. Yes. And you were telling me that there were times when you had to meet deadlines and so on that you would go for days at a time not sleeping, uh, just just you know meeting deadlines and getting stuff done. So, uh, you know, and and your full time practice and family. So how, how do you yeah. how do you work up the drive to, to I mean how long did it take you to do this? 
Well, you know, one could argue that I started this when I was in chiropractic school. Because right. what, what, the way the book evolved, the way it worked was that, I, you know, when you do different things in your life, you like to say you're motivated by something positive. Well, I have to admit, part of the motivation was being pissed off. Right. And I was just irritated with ignorance from instructors at life. <laughs> okay. And, and doctors in the field that would be so disparaging of upper cervical work, of things that I knew enough at that point knew was not true. So I was just dove in and read voraciously. Mm -hmm. And I would get read everything I got my hands on. And you know when you read a research paper, Chris, you read through it and you highlight the important parts of it and then you put it aside. But what I did is I would do that and then I would take the guts out of the paper and save it instead of having to reread the whole paper. Oh, and that's, that's really what the book is the about. The thing that's so unique about the book, when you look at it, it's a completely different looking book because there are huge sections that are completely written by me where I'm interpreting all this research myself. And then there's a very large part of it is the actual reprinting of excerpts from the research paper. So you see exactly what this author stated and then I do editorial comments where I tie everything in together and pull out the points and explain the importance of these different references here. It's enormous and, and it's amazing stuff. Uh, what you've done is you've put in one place uh, a lot of references that exist, but I, I, I talk about the secret doctrine in chiropractic. Uh, for example, as you well know, there's a lot of published information available in the upper cervical community that most chiropractors aren't even aware exists. Right. There are referee journals that have come and gone that had valuable information in them, uh, as well as, as some that um, are important but relatively obscure. And you know, I, I, I just look at this as a treasure trove, uh, you know, talking about sudden infant death syndrome, the Schneier and Burns study, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, some of the um, findings in, in medicine regarding atlantoaxial rotatory fixation, which is something that I was familiar with from the radiology literature, but again, something that a lot of people just might not know about. And uh, pulling together this whole issue of chiropractic assessments and instrumentation, uh, because you know many of the, uh, I call them naked emperors in chiropractic college, like to disparage objective assessments, notably x-ray analysis, leg checks, and instrumentation. Mm -hmm. And this has the meat and potatoes to support those things yes. uh, from a variety of sources so that, as you said, when, when one of these uh, characters is pontificating whose concept of chiropractic is just find the sore spot and bang on it until they say they feel better, uh, this is scientific and, and, and what, what you're suggesting uh, is, is that this is not so, and it's, it, it, it's so elegantly done. You know, Pat, you know, I'm looking at the thermal area here, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the Amatsu work. Reference, after reference, uh, after, reference after reference. Reference after reference, yeah. examples of telethermographic studies, examples of uh, pre-post studies. Yeah. Oh, that's you and your son, cool. And, and the other thing that this has got that a lot of people um, may have missed, and I noticed it wasn't even on, on your list of features, but I picked up on it right away, is a very concise description of research terminology. It talks about reliability, validity, oh, sensitivity, so specificity. Like in there. Yeah. Uh, those good. sorts of things described in, in a very user-friendly, easy-to-understand fashion. Yeah. Well, so you know, again, it, the, the, the amazing thing is that all this stuff is now in one place. Yep. Well, That's what blows my mind. You know, mind. you made a comment about, you know, sleepless nights and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, I will, one thing I want to point out about Dr. Kent here, I had I think seven or eight different reviewers and I was pretty sharp. I could, even though everything is blinded, you can pretty much tell who each reviewer is. Right. I can figure out by the way they're criticized. And there was one criticism you made about a little blurb I made about breastfeeding. Right. And it was about reviewing studies showing how chiropractic help with children have trouble breastfeeding. And I made a comment about its benefits. And you, may, you came back and said, well, you know, that's very nice, but it would be nice to have something to back it up. Mm -hmm. Well, that led to a five-day binge of reviewing the <laughs> literature on breastfeeding. So, <laughs> even though it's an, a, a, a book a one, little, I, one little item in a 500-page book. Quite frankly, book, I don't there, even remember There this, is, you know, there is a <laughs> section in there that has a 67 reference oh on the God. benefits of breastfeeding. <laughs> so I, I took that incidentally. and yeah. it took a long time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is, the book is not about upper cervical technique. And I want to make that mm -hmm. very clear. 
This is not a how-to book. There's an appendix in the right. book back that delves into placement and, and different mechanics. And you reference and the different types of upper cervical care. Absolutely. And again, even if you, quite frankly, I'll, I'll go one step further and say if you have no interest in upper cervical care per se, this is lot. something that should be in your library because it supports chiropractic on so many levels. As opposed to the how of upper cervical care, this is the why. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the why to me is so important because as a student or a doctor, if you don't understand why you need to do something, you're not going to put forth the time and effort to learn how. The why is the foundation for everything. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, when asked, well, what evidence do you have that you can influence this or that process? And as you do so well uh, in, in your emphasis that we're not treating disease, nonetheless, you make it very clear that we're dealing with something that impacts the totality of a person's being. And you do have very well-referenced specific examples of people with demonstrable conditions that have yes. experienced favorable changes. Absolutely. You discuss about how do you have the time to do these things. Well, you know, if you look at how many years I spent into doing this, you realize that, you know, this is a long, long time in coming. But, you know, basically the way I am, I'm a little strange because I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't play golf. I basically, my main thing is I, you know, play basketball and coach my son's, my boy's sports. And as my, a lot of people have the impression of me that I'm addicted to chiropractic because I do so much. And I love chiropractic, I love taking care of my patients, but I'd almost rather be coaching my son's sports right. than doing chiropractic. So, I mean, there is that balance. I mm -hmm. mean, chiropractic is, is a wonderful thing. And I think sometimes we look at the adjustment and we turn it into something that maybe it's not. And Dr. Grostick used to discuss how it's important not to exaggerate chiropractic because it's wonderful and beautiful as it is. Right. And it's a wonderful tool just the creating wellness concept that you're doing. You have many tools in creating this wellness concept. This is one tool. Right. And that's what it is. It's not a religion. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to worship. It is a real science. Yes. And of course, it's a beautiful science because it has a philosophy that drives it. And it has an art that you can apply it. And I think, Dr. You know, Sid Williams used to make comments about, you know, when we clear the subluxations, we're going to empty the jails and put everybody in, in yeah, church. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people would hear that and think, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Dr. Grostick always had a way of turning things around and making it seem so practical. And he would, he would discuss that the thing about chiropractic that affects people on a spiritual level is that when you look at all the book religions, and I'm a Christian personally, but when you look at all the book religions, they always discuss about a day of rest. Yes. And that's very important, you know, spiritually. But the problem with the subluxation is that you do not get a day of rest from it because you have it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. It is a physical stress. Yes. Whether you're aware of it or whether you're not, you've, you've it's still this, there. You've got all this dyspanetic activity going on, and your body's resources are allocated to adapting to a, a horribly aberrated physical state. Absolutely, and that was something that, you know, I think everyone can agree with. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's actually a great, uh, a great communication strategy, I think, for a patient saying, you know, when you're subluxated, you don't get a day of rest. You're under toil at all times. Sure, so and as Bruce Lipton it. has pointed out, you can't be in fight, flight, and growth at the same time. No, that's a, uh, absolutely certain. So uh, now that uh, you, you gave birth to this thing, and I, I know that that's almost a literal statement, uh, it's out there in the world. First of all, how, how do people get it? How, how can somebody buy the book? Probably the best way would to go right to the publisher's website. There is very simple. Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins is lww.com. There is a special page they have for me that is a kind of a long link, but all you have to do is type in Erickson, E R I K S E N, under the search, and it takes you straight there, and then that's how you order and, it. And again, and we'll put the reference on, sure. the, uh, on the reference sheet. So as of, as of this morning, um, I tried Amazon.com, and it was not on there, which is unusual because they do have a lot of chiropractic books. That's yeah. interesting because yeah. I thought I found it on Amazon huh. when I checked. I, a couple I, weeks. I tried both yeah, the titles. Yeah, I would say your name. We yes. should check into that because so, yes. uh, so many people just have the habit of going sure. to Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. to get it, but we'll put the reference on, but uh, I would definitely check in to uh, make sure that they found it kind of seamlessly in Amazon. But also, I, I think could, it would be wise too if we yeah. put the link on, on our, our site too. And yeah. even our webs, uh, you know, our, our teaching website too, which is orthospinology.org, which is the, the teaching organization that teaches this work too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like you yeah, too. your last name is spelt with a K, 
E R I K S E N, not yes. Owen. So some people looking might yeah, spell it. Yeah, there are uh, a lot of Ericsson texts on Amazon.com. Yeah, speaking of Amazon and, and whatnot, um, you know, Ericsson is Norwegian. Yeah. And uh, my nationality is my father's from Norway and my mother's from Brazil. Oh boy. So I tell patients that makes me half headhunter and half Viking. So that, that's a good combination to have as a doctor, I guess. <laughs> that's great. So uh, now that this is bird that's out there and, and we're excited to, uh, again, I think this should be a part of anybody's library that's a chiropractor. I mean, just, just to, to, you know, I, I could spend the whole day going through this thing, but, you know, there's a section here on uh, ADHD. There's a discussion of... Uh, the function of fever and the role that chiropractic and in the old days osteopathic care played in the great flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. Again, something we've written about and touched on on purpose. Yeah. Uh, vaccine related issues, uh, the immune system and uh, the interplay between the nervous system and the immune system. It's kind of like if There's you took so all there. of on purpose and, and, and amplified it and put it all in one place. Well, I want to give it's you guys a plug. Stuff. I mean, I mean, I put all this stuff together from various sources, but on purpose has been a big source yeah. for mm -hmm. the stuff that's in there. Well, you've been listening since the mid 1990s, right? Since uh, say, since ninety five. You, know, you weren't yeah. the first; you were among the first. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. I missed the first handful, but you uh -huh. know what I do? You know, which I hope other doctors do when they get the tapes. When they hear an article that really connects with them, is put a little asterisk next to that reference. And go if if nothing else, go to PubMed and yeah. pull it up and yeah. get the abstract. Right. What I did yeah, the, is the abstracts are free. Sure, absolutely. And and you know, um, so I'm indebted to you guys as well. And I, I think there's a place where I comment about that. But you know, I would like to say that every chiropractor gets some miracles. Sure. We all do. And 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 even accidentally we can get them. Yeah. But the thing that drove me early on is that I wanted to have more consistency with mm -hmm. this quote unquote miracles. Right. And like I said, there's many different ways of getting there, but when you look at the miracles that occur in chiropractic, the, high, the, the great majority were related to the upper cervical yes. spine. Even the cases where they don't attribute it to the atlas and they're attributing it to something different, they still adjusted the cervical spine. Yeah. And so I think you have, your best, uh, you have your best chance of getting these exciting results by working with the upper cervical spine and what I hope, if you under, truly understand the uniqueness of the upper cervical spine from an anatomical, kinematic, and a neurological standpoint, that you will naturally evolve towards a procedure that you think is the best at correcting this region. And of course, we delve in the book, it has um, stuff from orthospinology, grostic, uh, atlas orthogonality, Dr. Sweat's work, the Blair. NUCA organization, Blair, knee chest. And, and uh, some of those techniques are very, very similar, and some of them are, radic are quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. But I have learned over the years to have tremendous um, respect for um, all of my different colleagues and all chiropractors. Um, I just, you know, once again, I think that we just need to maybe take a, a closer look at what we're doing and realize that all of us, self-included, really need to get better at what we're doing. Not for our sakes, but for the patient's sake. That's great. So uh, now that this book is published, uh, we only have a minute or two, but you, you got a bunch of free time on your hands. <laughs> what are you doing with yourself? Yeah, well, right? it, you do a little more it, coaching, a little less writing? It's kind of funny because I find myself watching TV sometimes. <laughs> and, I, and I feel guilty because I feel like I need to be doing something. But, you know, one thing that I think uh, a lot of chiropractors realize, after you've been in practice for about 10 years, you got to watch it because you can start fighting a burnout syndrome, yes. you know? And it's like you talked about, um, you know, stamping beef all day long, and you kind of lose your focus <laughs> on that. And I guess the thing that I'd like to, um, to, to, close, to end with is that I would ask that you fall back in love with the art of what you're doing. Right. Because if nothing else, that will help prevent burnout. Because when you look at chiropractic, and I guess really the reason why the book was written is that I'm a very inquisitive person. I'm very curious. And chiropractic to me is so interesting. And when you look at it on a patient by patient basis on what you're doing with subluxations and of course using technology like the insight is very important in helping to, to learn more about that. But I think that it will bring more um, vigor into your practice and more passion. Mm -hmm. Also too, I would ask that, you know, look to put the patient needs first. You know, sometimes when we're out there and we're struggling 
and sometimes some pr doctors struggle to make money and, we, and we, we worry about the needs of ourselves and our families and I understand that but I think if you go back and you look at the patient's needs and truly correct the subluxation get them healthy things will tend to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and look at your practice because we're always looking at it from what's better for us sometimes and right. I think we've got to look at it from the patient's perspective too as well and you know the last thing I want to say is that you know I'm just a beggar telling other beggars where I found some bread That's it. <laughs> you know I'm not the the last word on this I'm not the the only source or the only knowledge on this but this is a big piece to the big puzzle of the validity of this profession. Folks, let's realize when we're talking about the green books and BJ, this is what it's about. I can pull many, many quotes from BJ that would back up everything I just said. He was dealing with the same issues we're dealing with now. Yeah. And if you're going to be congruent with your message that you're giving to patients, I think you have to take you know, the whole package. Yes. And that's important. Excellent. Well, Kirk, listen, I so appreciate all the work that you've done. I appreciate the fact that you, you flew up uh, from the South today to, to uh, share some time with us and, and, and make this particular program. Uh, I know that a lot of the chiropractors who listen to this are going to get a lot out of it, get them thinking again, get them focused again, which is, I think, a lot of what, what's happened as a result of your work and efforts. And all I can say is have a real respect and admiration for what you were able to accomplish. So uh, anyway, with, uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Kent, uh, congratulations, and uh, and thanks for sharing this message with our audience. So, uh, with uh, Drs. Uh, Christopher Kent and Kirk Erickson, I'm Dr. Patrick Gentempo, and you're listening to On Purpose. You are not alone. <laughs>